Hi, I'm Steve Clemens. I run the foreign policy programs at the New American Foundation and publish the blog, The Washington Note. And I'm here with my friend Nick Thompson. He's a long-time fellow and been part of the success of the New American Foundation for many years, a senior editor previously with Wired and, and Legal Times. I mean, he may still be employed there. I don't know. Still Wired. But, senior editor Wired. Okay, well, that aside, he's written a very powerful and important new book, The Hawk and the Dove, Paul Nitza, George Kennan, and the History of the Cold War. Uh, truth in advertising. Paul Nitza was his grandfather, but I can say after reading the book that he gives his grandpa no, no breaks <laughs> uh, in the discussion. So uh, what do you think Americans who read this book uh, should get beyond a fascinating history uh, of the rivalry between two guys? What, what do you want, want to convey to people? And what's its relevance today? Um, I want people to understand the Cold War in a way they haven't. I wanted to write a history that people would actually enjoy reading so that you can get inside the specific debates. You can get inside the Korean War and what mattered with the Korean War. You can get inside the Vietnam War by reading about what these two people were thinking. I want people to understand the great debate over containment, which defined American Cold War strategy. I want them to understand what Kennan thought of containment, what Nitsa thought of containment, where the Cold War could have gone awry. I want people to have a new way of thinking about all these complex issues by looking at their lives. What can you get today is you can A, see a very civil debate between two people who disagreed. One thing that really interested me when I started this project is that Nitsa and Kennan both believed that the other was going to blow up the world. Hmm. But they're friends the entire time. Hmm. You know, Paul Nitz was my grandfather. George Kennan came to the wedding of my parents. I mean, they, were, they weren't best friends, but they were extremely civil. And there are moments where they're disagreeing intensely, but they're also quite kind and quite respectful to each other. And it's a very interesting to try to understand why that happened. Also, Seems like that civility has kind of disappeared today. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and it's something, that, it's something that we've lost, and writing about it, I hope, is a way to help us understand and figure out how to, how to regain it. You can also, I mean, the idea of containment, which is the central, one of the central ideas of the Cold War, and you know, big fight between Nitz and Kennan is how you define containment, is an idea that absolutely you can apply to today. I mean, the notion of containment is that you don't need to overthrow your adversary. You don't need to overthrow Stalinist Russia. You need to contain it. You need to keep it in a box. And eventually it will disappear. Uh, and eventually it will fold and we will become, a, we will be a stronger, more successful nation. So with that a country like applied. Iran, would, I mean, I could easily see how Kennan would be an advocate of a containment strategy with right. Iran today, to put it in a contemporary sense. But I could also see how your grandfather, Paul Nitsa, might be an advocate of regime change. Yeah. And, and, and is, that a, is that an inaccurate assessment? The first part is absolutely accurate. I think Kennan would um, be in favor of containment, and by that he would mean we don't need to overthrow Iran. First of all, if we try to, we will fail, mm -hmm. right? That's part of Kennan's, that's Kennan's realism. Um, if they get a nuclear weapon, it's not the end of the world, you know? What we need to do is we need to do everything we can to foster the dissidents who could actually overthrow this government. And he would be all in favor of covert action to do this. He would all, want all sorts of shenanigans to try to prop them up. Now, what my grandfather would think about a policy towards Iran is much more complicated. My grandfather was so focused on one issue, which is how do we deal with the Soviet Union, how do we deal with the nuclear balance of power with the Soviets, that it's harder to apply his grand strategy and his thoughts to our contemporary debates. Um, one thing, though, is that you know, there is a theme running through all of his thinking that the best way to respond to your adversary is to look at the capabilities, to look at what they really could do to prescribe them sort of the most malevolent intentions that are reasonable. And if you do that to Iran, then you take the expectation that they could trade their nuclear, they could sell away their nuclear weapons, they could be a huge source of instability. So I think he would go to the Iran debate with the premise that this is a great danger. Now, what he would recommend we do, I'm not certain, mm. but it is possible that, as you said, he could be in favor of a you know, policy. Nick, you're very plugged in. You're sort of, um, you know, I told somebody the other day, you're sort of like a foreign policy aristocrat, a <laughs> prince of the Cold War, uh, <laughs> given your, your lineage. Uh, but you do follow what's going on today. Yeah. Do you think that there are rivalries today that are sort of like what you saw back then that matter? You know, Dennis Ross versus Bill Burns, yeah. who's the Under Secretary of State at, at, at State, they have very different worldviews. Uh, we saw inside the Bush White House, you know, Bob Gates versus Cheney or, mm -hmm. you know, various other players in which you can use them as devices to tell stories. Yeah. But do you think that there is the same kind of rivalry that has a, a consequence on national security um, structure and the, the, the course of American history, if you will, like between these two, two men? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, I imagine there is, and I think the way to look at it would be to try to figure out who the players are who've been around for a long time and been at the center of it. You know, Holbrook is one, Ross is another, Gates is another, right? And try to see whether, you know, I don't know enough about their, 
I certainly don't know enough about their personal friendships to know who has a, a good friendship. Uh, and I don't think I could answer. If I were to say, you know, what is the success of this? You could do the Hawk this? and the Dove Part 2 maybe if I could today. Do the, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who it would be. I, I would, yeah. If I were to do another dual biography, it would be MacArthur Marshall or something like that. I see, I see. <laughs> well, what, you know, and, and I guess just to, to, to wrap up real quickly, as I think about this and I think about the contemporary challenges, you know, you write about this one section about Eisenhower and yeah. the solarium uh, mm -hmm. exercise in which your grandfather was excluded, but which yeah. Kennan played a key role. And you thought your grandfather was excluded because he was an advocate of military spending. And yeah. But there were other people there, like Curtis LeMay was involved, John Foster Dulles was involved. And I'm wondering, do you think the United States in America today, in Washington, we've become kind of casual Curtis LeMays, that mm -hmm. war is easy? Uh, I was always struck, particularly in the Berlin Airlift section, which is yeah. just mesmerizing, how both Kennan and Paul Nitze, mm -hmm. surprisingly Paul Nitze, knew that even in America's mm -hmm. strong position after World War II, that a, that a conventional conflict with the Soviets would be of extraordinary cost, yeah. and backed us away from that and took a different strategy with the Berlin Airlift. Do you think a little bit about that? Oh, absolutely. And I think one, you know, the book is called The Hawk and the Dove, but my grandfather is a hawk when it comes to the arsenal, and he's a dove when it comes to using it. Hmm. I mean, every time there's a potential conflict, he backs away from it. And this is, you know, during the Berlin Airlift. He does it more, most famously during the Korean War, where he is hmm. actually in charge of deciding what to do once we have the information that there were Soviet pilots dressed up as North Korea's fighting us. Do we publicize that and hmm. escalate, or do we hide it? And he writes a recommendation that we hide it, and in fact, we burn every, copies of his, every copy of his report that says to do that. Hmm. And that is, I think, he understood, you know, the large consequences of, of of nuclear war. His first job that mattered was with the Strategic Bombing Survey in 1945. And he goes to Hiroshima right after the bombs have hit. And he studies it and he understands it and he thinks about it. And there were times late in his life, I heard a great story from my, from my uncle, from his son. And he remembers, you know, my grandfather was very clinical in his arguments, very fun yeah. to argument. But he remembered, my uncle remembered him getting very passionate once. And that was, uh, somebody said, you know, Mr. Nitze, you just don't understand nuclear war, and that's why you're in favor of building up our arsenal. And my grandfather got very intense and said, no, actually, I'm one of the few people who does understand nuclear war, and that's why I'm in favor of building up our nuclear arsenal. Well, Nick, thanks very much. Congratulations on this book. And I have read the book. I, I highly, I don't often do this, but I do highly commend <laughs> this book, The Hawk and the Dove. It's so much uh, in the tradition of other great uh, books that I've seen, you know, Strobe Talbot's The Deadly Gambit. Uh, Gambits and uh, uh, Wizards of Armageddon by Fred Kaplan. I really think this That's is a great, be a great be trilogy in. over a period of, you know, America's Cold War history. So, congratulations, Nick. Thanks, Thanks a lot, very much. Steve.